Rainer Maria Rilke once wrote this, Be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart, and try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you, because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. My children ask me lots of questions. If you have kids or if you have nieces or nephews, I'm sure that the kids in your life ask you lots of questions too. I actually like when my children ask me questions. Why? Because it means that they still need me, that they haven't become fully self-sufficient yet. I like it when they're trying to figure something out and they ask for my help. In fact, it is in those moments that I often feel closest to them. Whether it's showing my son how to work some piece of technology or applying mud masks to our faces with my daughter, I like it when they ask me for assistance. I can't help but think that this isn't inherent in us in some sense and that it is a reflection of our relationship with God as God's children. The Advent season is for many a season of familiarity and certainty. That's what so many of us love about it. In this season where we read our stories and sing our songs about the arrival of the Christ on Christmas, many of us are solid, unwavering in everything that we believe. We love this about Advent. While the other seasons on the church calendar might be more difficult to grasp, Christmas feels familiar to us more like a homecoming in our beliefs rather than a deconstruction of them. But I'm not so sure that this is what God wants for us in this season each year. I would posit that Advent, above all, ought to be the biggest of mysteries, leaving us with far more questions than it does answers. The problem is, because the Advent story is a thing that's written down for us in Scripture, we go through it as if we're reading from a script, stripping the mystery from it altogether. The angel appears to Mary. Oh, I know this one. Mary becomes pregnant. Yeah, I know this one. Mary and Joseph can't find a room. I know this one. Jesus is born in a manger. Yes, my favorite part. I love this one. But imagine if you didn't have a script. Imagine if you were the script. What if you were one of the characters in the story writing the script with your very life? I believe that this is where God wants us to place ourselves in the stories that lead us up to Christmas in the season of Advent. Not as people looking back on history, knowing what comes next, but as if we are living it with the characters in the story for the very first time. We've been studying through the book of Isaiah this year for Advent, looking at passages that point to the arrival of Christ at Christmas. Today's passage from the seventh chapter, the 10th through the 14th verses says this. Again, the Lord spoke. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But I said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord God to the test. 
Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The young woman will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. This is one of the many Old Testament passages where God becomes impatient with his creatures. And these passages are always tricky to navigate. It's easy just to think, oh, another Old Testament passage where God is perturbed. I'm going to skip this one next. The problem is if we do that too often, we miss some really good lessons about who God is. And this is one of them. Instead of looking away from this passage this morning, let us look further in together. What is it here in this passage that makes God angry? God tells the person in this story, in this instance, it's a king named Ahaz. God tells the king to ask for a sign. And the king responds with, no, I won't ask, I won't test God. And then God responds with, I told you to ask me for a sign and you won't do it. Why are you testing my patience? And then finally, God says, since you won't ask me for it, I'm going to send it. Voila, roll the Christmas story. And here is what is most puzzling. The king here is refusing to test God, even though God is asking him to, because the king is being obedient to the scriptures. The section that says, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test, is a reference to a passage in the book of Deuteronomy that says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. That's in Deuteronomy 6.16. And the king here in this passage from Isaiah is only obeying what's already been written, quoting it to God. And God gets upset by this because clearly the king has elevated what was written down over the God that is right here, right now, asking for something different. So why is God perturbed with the king? Well, it's because the king was so sure, so committed to what was written down then, that he wouldn't do what God was asking now. Friends, God wants us to ask questions. There are times where God wants us to set aside everything that's been written down, everything that we are fully convinced of, and ask, what is God doing? What is God saying right here, right now? Even if that feels wrong, even if it feels like rebellion, even though we are quoting God's words back to God to support our need for a map that never changes, God is asking us to ask questions, to put our God to the test. What are you so sure about in your life today? What are you fully convinced of in your belief system today? What are those things that you believe in so deeply that you can quote chapter and verse four, silencing all naysayers, reducing them to rubble with your wrecking ball of biblical prowess? What if you're wrong? What if you don't have all of the information? What if there's something you don't see yet? 
something that God wants you to see, but you won't be able to see it unless you put the Lord your God to the test, asking questions. This is the posture that God wants us to take in Advent. Not an unwavering posture of certainty grounded in memorized quotations, but a posture of mystery, a posture of questions. It is our honest questions where God is longing to hear from us. God wants to show us even more. Are we blind because we've decided that we already see enough? I actually like it when my children ask me questions. Why? Because it means they still need me. That they haven't become fully self-sufficient yet. I like it when they're trying to figure something out and they ask for my help. In fact, it's in those moments that I often feel closest to them. Be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers, which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Let us spend a few moments now in stillness and reflection, being courageous enough, believing enough to ask questions of God, to put God to the test. If you would like to receive the Eucharist with us, to receive communion with us, you can gather the elements at this time. If you don't have unleavened bread and wine, that's fine. Whatever you have available is sufficient. But let's spend a few moments now asking God our most demanding questions. Amen. Thank you.